Austerity, definition, punishing the poor for the mistakes of the rich. The fundamental debate in this country and across Europe is austerity bringing massive government borrowing under control, or is it simply pushing us further into recession? Here, bad industrial production figures suggest the British economy is now very close to triple-dip recession. Despite this, the government insists cuts are the only option. <laughs> Across Europe, there's been a continent-wide experiment in austerity taking place for the past three years. The True Believers says it's, cut, it says it's cut ballooning government deficits and kept borrowing rates low. Critics like Paul Krugman say it's just made a bad situation worse by choking off fragile post-crisis demand. Here in the UK, today's awful industrial production figures play to the fears of those austerity critics. A shock fall in industrial output in January by 1.2%. Part of that down to North Sea oil platforms shutting for maintenance. But manufacturing is flat too. It means production is now at its lowest level since May 1992, more than 20 years ago. An official return to recession, the so-called triple dip, is now very much on the cards. The bigger picture since Britain's austerity experiment began is one of stagnation. Here's how the official government forecasts for British recovery back in June 2010 when the coalition took power. There's the recession and here's the strong recovery predicted on the under the coalition's original tough medicine. But here's what actually happened. Output more or less flat for nearly three years. The difference, about 4% of national economic output. That's how much smaller the economy has turned out to be. A recovery has never been so sluggish in Britain and this hasn't happened in the US, Germany and all other major economies. The timing of the flattening is also uncanny. Mid-2010, the question, how much of a role did the coalition package of spending cuts and tax rises play in this line? Last week, David Cameron claimed none, but his own budget watchdog wrote to him to disagree. Of course, a far bigger experiment in austerity has been taking place in the Eurozone, in Greece, under a programme of huge upfront cuts designed by the EU IMF-led Troika. Again, the results have gone way off course. Back in 2010, the Greek economy was expected to shrink by a mere 5% over three years as the cuts programme demanded by the European Union was implemented. So far, it's actually fallen by 17% and will carry on shrinking this year. Spain's testing of the austerity approach is also worsening enormous social problems. Unemployment's now over 6 million. 56% of young people now out of work and similar pictures emerge in Greece and to some degree Ireland. The argument is erupting around Europe and in the US, Paul Krugman says the advocates of more austerity in Europe are, quote, petulant and delusional and are pursuing cockroach policies, meaning ideas that were flushed away in the past, but they keep on coming back. It's been a team effort with a lot of hard work. And now that team effort is paying off. The plan is working. For the first time in a long time, there's a real sense that Britain is on the rise. Jobs are being created. The deficit is coming down. And that brings its own risks. As we start the new year, I want to warn you about a dangerous new complacency around in our politics at the moment. You hear some of my political opponents talking as if the hard part of the job is done and we can go back to the old habits. But beware the opposition politicians who come along this year and promise you easy answers, no more sacrifices, just more spending on this and more spending on that, all paid for by more borrowing. I focus on one of the key takeaways from this autumn statement, which is, of course, that the net public sector borrowing from the end of next year is going to be much higher. Yes, he's limited the increase in, in welfare spending. But I said to him, you know, what are we going to do about the spending? Isn't it true that we're still spending far too much? This is what he had to say. Well, we've got to get a control on spending. That's why I'm uprating benefits by less than the rate of inflation. That's why I've curbed the tax relief for the largest pension pots. But we are making progress. The deficit is down by 25%. It's forecast to continue to fall. So we are making progress. Britain started with a very large deficit, but we're getting it down. 
you've drawn criticism from your own party about the lack of measures to support growth. When are we going to see measures that boost the long-term growth of this economy and, and wealth creation? Well, I think you see two sorts of measures. First of all, big structural reforms to education and welfare, which will make our country more competitive. But also, yesterday, changes to our tax regime. So we now have one of the lowest corporation tax rates of any major economy in the world. We've just cut it so that it will be 21 percent, much lower than our competitors. People know that there are no quick fixes to these problems, but they want to know that we are making progress. And the message from today's autumn statement is that we are making progress. It is a hard road, but we're getting there. Forster paused because of all the jeering. He then had to announce that the government would miss one of its own fiscal targets. In short, the tougher economic conditions mean that while our deficit is forecast to go on falling, instead of taking three years to get our debt falling, it's going to take four. As for benefits, they'll be capped well below inflation. But most working age benefits, including job seekers allowance, employment and support allowance and income support, will be uprated by 1% for the next three years. Today, after two and a half years, we can see and people can feel in the country the true scale of this government's economic failure. It wasn't the statement the Chancellor hoped to deliver. It wasn't what the country wanted to hear. If the winter was feeling pretty bleak already, it just got rather bleaker. George Osborne should be arrested. He should be arrested for misappropriation of public funds. See, like, like they, they've got this back to work, the work programme, £60,000 per job. The, better, the, the welfare is going up not going down, and they keep cutting benefits because they're moving public money into private pockets. 60 grand siphoned off into private pockets. While the people who profit from that are, 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 are paying no tax and, 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 putting it, and putting their profits into offshore accounts. It is not a recession, it's a robbery. The Chancellor of the Exchequer, he is saying the cuts aren't working, so we're going to have to cut even deeper. We're going to have to cut even more. Not having people sucking the life, sucking the life. So people end up destitute. The homeless, the f***ing, the disabled, the f***ing single mums, the elderly, children are not smashed to pieces. The reason why there's downgrades is because austerity alone can't do the trick. In fact, they say cutting spending in this way in the euro area can be self-defeating. Without growth, you can't get deficits down. The irony is we are not in the eurozone. George Osborne is making the same mistake which the rating agencies say is leading to the downgrades in the Eurozone. Austerity, self-defeating, high unemployment, not getting the deficit down. I can't believe we're making the Euro mistake when we're not in the Euro. OK, today you're saying um, you're going to have to accept that you can't reverse uh, the spending cuts, tax rises and real terms pay cuts uh, in the public sector. Have you changed your mind about anything here or is this what you always thought? Well, look, I've been consistent all along saying that cutting too far and too fast wouldn't work. I've said it would lead to higher unemployment, wouldn't get the deficit down. That's proving to be true. What that means is the inheritance for Labour is going to be very hard indeed. I'm saying today we can't promise now in three years time to reverse spending cuts or tax rises. We don't know where we're going to be. It's going to be very hard. And I'm also saying in the meantime, and this is really hard for people working in the public and private sectors, it's the reality. George Osborne's failure means that pay restraint will have to continue. Without that, we'll have higher unemployment. Jobs must come first. That's the reality. And it's, it helps me to say that, to show to you I'm credible and tough in setting out an alternative to George Osborne. We've never denied we needed a plan to get the deficit down. That would mean tough decisions on tax and spending. I set out a billion pounds of cuts when I was education secretary. But as a party and a leadership, I said then I still believe Labour should have been clearer before the, elected, the election that if we'd been re-elected, there would have been spending cuts as well as tax rises. 
And today, I have no illusions that it is a big task to turn around Labour's economic credibility and show, even as George Osborne delivers stagnating growth, rising unemployment, long-term reform stalling, that Labour can be trusted again. And however difficult this is for me, for some of my colleagues and for our wider supporters, we can't make any commitments now that the next Labour government will reverse tax rises or spending cuts, and we won't, because we don't know how bad things will be on unemployment growth and the deficit. What we do know is the next Labour government will have to sort out a deficit this government has failed to do. But George Osborne's economic mistakes now mean difficult decisions on tax, spending and pay are not only inevitable, that they will last for longer. It is now inevitable that pay restraint will have to continue for longer in this Parliament. Labour cannot duck that reality and we won't. Jobs must be our priority before pay. You hear a lot about political consensus. Apparently it's consensual to attack benefit claimants. Regardless of the fact that the most biggest majority of benefit claimants are workers. You know, the Tories, they try and promote the image, don't they? With the, the shut curtains analogy of that man of darkness, Mr. Osborne. How do these people know? 29 members in a cabinet, 23 of them are personal millionaires. What do they know about living in low pay, living in benefit, living in a council house? What do they know about these things and worrying about the future of your kids? They don't know about it. They get in and out of the studios for their sound bites off the Starship Enterprise because that's the different planet that they inhabit. I've debated with them with things like the bedroom tax, as Marie said earlier, where you talk about how they have decided to attack some of the very poorest, most vulnerable people. They've not just went for the working class, they've went for the poorest sections of the working class. Because the only people that are affected by the bedroom tax are those in receipt of housing benefit. To be in receipt of housing benefit, you have to prove that you're poor. It's a means-tested benefit. You have to either be low paid or you have to be on benefit. Well, brothers and sisters, they're going after you if you're in that position. Why? Because they think you're an easy target. And I've debated with these cretins that say, oh, you know, don't they think about taking in the lodger if they've got an extra bedroom? <laughs> well, that's all right, isn't it, for them, for the Tory Toffs and their mansions and their 12 and 14 bedrooms. They ought to try and live in a council or a housing association house where you can hardly swing a cat, never mind taking in a lodger. But it shows you just how little they know. Because if you did take in a lodger, you would lose your housing benefit. <laughs> That's how stupid they are with their arguments. Here at home, the banking system is still not working as we need it to do. So we're still fixing it. And we've got to do even more to encourage the exports and the investment and the saving our economy needs for a responsible recovery. Above all, we've still got a huge amount to do to reduce the deficit and to get our debts falling. And it's worth remembering, as the festive season comes to an end, that our own independent Office for Budget Responsibility is predicting a slowing of quarterly GDP growth this year. So it is far too soon to say, job done. It's not even half done. That's why 2014 is the year of hard truths, the year when Britain faces a choice. Do we say the worst is over? Back we go to our bad habits of borrowing and spending and living beyond our means and let the next generation pay the bill. Or do we say to ourselves, yes, because of our plan, things are getting better. But there is still a long way to go and there are big underlying problems we have to fix in our economy. More repairs, more cuts, more difficult decisions. That's the choice in 2014. Well, look, George Osborne's borrowing £158 billion more. But let's just talk about what he wants to do. Uh, any government now would be borrowing 
The question is, are you borrowing to get unemployment down or are you borrowing to pay for the cost of rising unemployment? You can also be clear, though, now, can't you, that if you are elected at the next election, there will have to be more cuts. Well, I fear that George Osborne's promise to get rid of the deficit in a parliament is just not going to happen. To be honest, it never was because that was too fast. Well, there wasn't going to happen under Labour's plan either, was it? So, I mean, that there will have to be more cuts the great in irony, the next parliament. The great irony is that um, George Osborne is borrowing more than under Labour's plan to half the deficit because he's failing so badly. There is no doubt, as Ed Miliband said earlier this week, the inheritance for Labour will be difficult. We'll have to have continued restraint. It's going to be difficult on spending. And more cuts. The key to this is can you get growth in the economy and unemployment falling? Look, I, I'm not denying from you at all, Krishna, it's going to be difficult and we will not be able to spend the money we'd like to spend and it may well be there'll have to be some cuts we don't want to make. And I can't promise to reverse any of the cuts now. I've got to say, though, abolishing the Future Jobs Fund and pushing up youth unemployment, what a foolish cut from George Osborne. It's made things worse, not better. What's the point of the Labour Party if it wants to cut the pay of some of the poorest public sector workers in Britain? Well, because socialism is the language of priorities, as Bevan said. And the question is now, is the priority more pay for people in work when unemployment is so high, or does restraint allow us to have more jobs? Well, it's really not... terms cuts, isn't it, what you uh, call well, restraint? Look, I think it's very difficult indeed what's happening for public and private sector workers. It's a consequence of George Osborne's failure, but I can't argue for higher wages at the expense of jobs. It is about priorities, and jobs must come first. Let's admit it. We've changed our opponents, at least on the surface, and so made them electable, and that's tough. Anyone with the salt, brothers and sisters. In my opinion, anyone with the salt within the Labour Party, they should welcome a yes vote. Not because it means they can roll away the red flags because there'll be no role for them in an independent Scotland. On the contrary, the Labour Party in Scotland would be rejuvenated transformed in an independent Scotland. Because in an independent Scotland, when you stood for the Labour Party, you could actually stand for Labour values instead of the South East Tory values that the Labour Party now stands for. Well, you know, all across uh, Britain right now, people are going to be watching this in their homes, uh, businesses. They're going to be, have been watching what the Chancellor was saying very, very closely and trying to figure out now, uh, as we came over the different facts and figures, exactly what that means to them in real terms. Now, in that respect, when you listen to the autumn statement, a very concerning part of that speech that George Osborne delivered was when he spoke about welfare. And really, we saw the Conservative attack uh, on welfare continuing. And now you listen to the language and the rhetoric that was used there he talked about fairness but then he said fairness also needs to be about the person who leaves home in the morning and looks over to their neighbor who's asleep living a life on benefits I'm not sure how much George Osborne really knows about living on benefits but I can tell you it's not much of a life uh, RT has spent the last couple of months investigating exactly what is going on with the UK's welfare system and it's a miserable failure all round. The work programme figures released a week or so ago, failing the people on benefits, and uh, recently brought in a new rule uh, for people on disability benefits who are going to perhaps be forced into unpaid work. I mean, it really smacks of back to the days of the British workhouses. And it is incredibly concerning. And, you know, I, I'm not pulling any punches here. The state of the welfare system in this country right now is absolutely diabolical. And in the coming years, you're going to have some horrendous stories coming out about these people, the most vulnerable in our society, suffering. And really, if you go into the detail of what George Osborne was saying today, it seems that the most vulnerable in society are going to be the ones who are, in fact, going to have to pay for this continued austerity. And make no mistake, they're really going to suffer. This is an austerity programme that's not even halfway through. And we still have more cuts ahead of us, more cuts to spending, more cuts to welfare, and more real-term pain for the people in this country. Sarah, I can tell how this is affecting you. Tougher times ahead for all Brits, and it's going to be an even tougher end of the year. Thank you very much. Sarah Frother reporting live from London. You look at the Office of National Statistics figures. 
They show that we now have bailed out the banking sector to the tune of £19,000 for every man, woman and child across the United Kingdom. £1.2 trillion pounds is how much has been used to bail out the bankers. How dare they attack benefit claimants? How dare they attack trade unionists? How dare they attack immigrants or anyone else that is unable to speak up for themselves when the reality is it's the rich and the privileged that are the problem. Austerity, definition, punishing the poor for the mistakes of the rich. That's what austerity represents, brothers and sisters. And we have an opportunity, don't we? We have an opportunity in September 18th to say, no, we're not travelling in this bus any longer. We're getting off this bus. We're going to do things differently. You see, let's not make the mistake. Deliberately, you'll hear from those with their project fear and their negativity. You know, it's all about Alex Salmon. Do you really support the SNP? Brothers and sisters, this vote is bigger than any single political party. This vote is about the very future of our country, of our children, of our children's children. This vote isn't about whether you like Alex Salmon or you don't like Alex Salmon. This vote is about whether your country is going to put people before profit, about whether your country is going to send young kids to die in illegal wars, about whether your country is going to spend money and giving kids a decent, healthy, nutritious, free meal, or whether your country is going to have a publicly owned health service and a mail service which has been privatised in England, but won't be privatised in Scotland. On the 18th of September 2014, between the hours of 7am and 10pm, for the first time ever, the Scottish people will have absolute sovereignty lying in their hands. The question then is, do they keep it or do they give it away to another nation to keep control over them? That's the key question. If at one minute past 10 p.m. we have a yes vote, we are powerful. If we have a no vote at one minute past 10 p.m., we are powerless. That's what the referendum is really about. Power or powerlessness. I'm now 76 years old. I have 10 grandchildren. And although my wife calls me a grumpy grandpa, I'm actually a very concerned grandpa. What have I got to tell those 10 grandchildren if we vote no? Have I got to tell them to stay in a Scotland where we'll have heavy unemployment, low wages and continuing inequality or tell them to do what others have done before them, get the best qualifications you possibly can and get out to Canada, Australia or New Zealand. I get quite angry when I look at this Better Together slogan. It's a fraud. The United Kingdom, the British state, is skint. And it's in the final stages of imperial decline. It's got 1.5 trillion pounds worth of debt. That's what we're heading towards. And individual debt, that's folk with mortgages and credit cards, is now over 1.4 trillion pounds. It's a country, a state, that's in serious decline. Now, any fool can drive a recovery with massive debt being taken on by the people. And this Tory government down in Westminster is engaged in a deceit on the people. People are not aware of it. But for every £10 of cuts to come, we've only had one of them. £9 are still to come. 90% of the cuts to get that debt down are still to come. 
And after they got past the election in 2015, that's when austerity will come in with its tackety boots on. We will find that the bedroom tax will look like a gift from Santa Claus compared to what's going to come after 2015 if we vote no. We have to escape from that failed British state. And the only way we can escape is by voting yes in the referendum and have a powerful Scotland powering its way ahead. I think we are perfectly capable of running our country in a far better way than run by another nation. If we were better off run by another nation, by now it should be proved. You know, we should have full employment, we shouldn't have any poverty, we'd have a better distribution of wealth and power. That hasn't happened. It will only happen when we get rid of this crippling myth that's destroyed the moral and political backbone of the Scottish nation and realise that we have ability, individually and as people. And if we've got the power, then we can use that ability to carve an entirely different course. Not for me, at 76 year old, but for the children and the grandchildren and the children as yet not born in this country. That's what independence is about.